Please welcome Nick Hanauer, venture capitalist and Civic Ventures co-founder, and Ali Velshi, MSNBC anchor. Welcome back, friends, to the Philadelphia Citizen. I'm Ali Velshi, and uh, I'm excited to have this conversation with Nick Hanauer. It's actually uh, picking up on a conversation Nick and I and the former Labor Secretary Robert Reich had uh, on TV, on MSNBC, uh, a year and a half ago, probably. And, and I want to discuss how much has changed and how much has stayed the same. But first, for those of you who don't know Nick, uh, you're about to, and you should get to know him a lot better. He is the founder of uh, Civic Ventures, which is a nonprofit he's going to tell us a little bit about. He's also the co-founder and partner of uh, a Seattle-based venture capital firm called Second Avenue Partners. He's the host of uh, the Pitchfork, Pitchfork Economics podcast. He's the co-author of a couple of great books, uh, The True Patriot in 2007, Gardens of Democracy in 2011. Uh, those of you know that I'm a Canadian. Uh, Gardens of Democracy is one of 10 books that Justin Trudeau thinks everyone should read. His Twitter handle is Nick. Nick Hanauer, and I say that to you now because you should follow him and the things he talks about. Uh, Nick, welcome, first of all. It is great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really the, great. The, the concept here is ideas we should steal for people in Philadelphia, ideas that go on elsewhere uh, and, and that we should steal. And the first idea that I think we should steal, and I have not cleared this with the, with the people at Philadelphia Citizen, and I don't know if we're allowed to swear on this uh, thing, but we should call BS on uh, newly minted corporate gurus who have finally decided that, wow, what, what a weird, unequal world in which we live where women don't earn what men do for the same job. And wow, people earn less than 15 bucks an hour. And oh, by the way, we employ a lot of those people. Um, it, it, it's kind of weird because in my world, when these CEOs come out and say things like this, uh, the, the news media goes crazy and they run their clips all the time. Jamie Dimon and all these other guys, they run their clips. It's like, you know, most of us understood this beforehand. And by the way, most of the bottom half of society that isn't rich and doesn't invest in stocks and earns a wage already knew how tough it was to live. We are in the richest country in the world and maybe 100 million Americans, maybe one third of our society right now is what's called food insecure. They're not sure how they're paying for tomorrow's meal. That's right. And, you know, uh, uh, these feel good pronouncements from the business round table or whoever it is, uh, I, I, look, I, I, would, I just want to acknowledge it's a step in the right direction. Of course it is. Uh, but it is massively inadequate to the challenge that we face as a society. And there is no existence proof that the goodwill of uh, incredibly powerful, self-interested people will drag society for, forward. Correct. That if we truly care about these issues, uh, what's, what's essential is, is to require large corporations to pay people enough to get by uh, with security and indignity, not to hope that uh, a few uh, very wealthy people will feel sorry for everybody and, uh, you know, it, 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 at their leisure, do the right thing. Right. And fund hospitals. And I, that was yeah. one of the arguments we heard in the last year. You know how much money these rich people give to hospitals? Well, well OK, that's great. And I'm really glad that they really do. You're one of those people who've actually made that pledge to give most of your wealth away. But that's right. But our society's health shouldn't actually depend on charity. Yeah, and Ali, I think that it, it, um, what, what all of the folks who are watching this need to know is the dimension of the problem. And, and I wanna point uh, everybody to a recent RAND, uh, uh, Rand uh, Corp uh, study on the dimensions of inequality and uh, a piece that I and David Rolfe wrote for Time Magazine that details what happened since 1975, since the beginning of the neoliberal era. And to make a long story short, over that 45 years, $50 trillion has been redistributed yep. from the bottom 90% of Americans to the top 1%. It's $2.5 trillion per year from the point of view of the median full-time worker who earns $50,000 a year, if, they, if that person had been held harmless 
by the la for, for, from the last 40 years of neoliberal economic policy. Instead of earning $50,000 a year, they would earn $92,000 a year, or really probably closer to 100 if you use a better inflation metric. And that gap between $50,000 a year and $100,000 a year explains so much of the social and political pathologies that we face today from our polarized politics, right? Where everyone's angry because they feel like they've gotten screw, screwed. And they're not all wrong. No, they're right. Yeah. That's the thing is those Trump voters who are pissed off, I think they've made the wrong choice in voting, but their anger is righteous and, and absolutely explainable in terms of the fact that, you know, because, I mean, look, some of them are racists and I have no sympathy for that, but, but, the but some of them are just working people who think they haven't gotten their piece of the pie. Well, yeah, and it, it's true. That is a fact. They have not gotten treated fairly by this country, by, by the way, Republicans and Democrats. Universal <laughs> health, right? You know, I'm from Canada. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're nearby. Right. Um, Universal health care, universal health coverage. When I talk to voters about this in, uh, coming up to the election, people who didn't like it said it's socialism. Oh. So it's not because socialism is the control of production. Uh, all, all we're doing is paying for your health insurance. Um, and, and this concept that things that we can do better together for the greater good does yes. not equal socialism. Yes. That's actually capitalism. What you're well, arguing for teamwork. is a better capitalism. Yes. Teamwork. Right? Teamwork. Teamwork and cooperation. So, so one of the, you know, one of the, th there's all sorts of things that are incredibly um, destructive about neoliberal thinking. One of them, one of the core concepts, of course, is our theory of human behavior, which is homo economicus, that people are perfectly selfish and rational. And here's why that's so dangerous, Ali, is if you embed that idea in people's heads that people are purely selfish, dependably selfish, and a reasonable person looks around the world at all of the prosperity in it, then they must conclude, it follows logically, that selfishness is the cause of that prosperity. And the more selfish we are, the more prosperity we create. And there is a direct line from that a fundamental economic assumption to shareholder value maximization, that the only purpose of the corporation is to enrich shareholders. Right. And executives, and, and we have not we we've we've left out the land and 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 the people who eat off of it or breathe the, uh, the air, and we left workers out of that equation. That's right. The point for workers right. was to pay them as little as possible to stop them from going to another job. End of story. As opposed to valuing them differently, and this Absolutely. this is requires creativity because if I'm not paying you just to not take another job. If I'm not paying you, if I'm not maximizing my wages and my benefits so that you don't go work for ABC News, for instance, yeah. as opposed to NBC, I, I have to figure out what am I really paying you for? What is value? And we somehow have figured out how to figure out value for the highest paid in our society because yes. we pay them uh, really well. Right. Uh, but for the lowest paid in our society, we will not pay them 10 cents more an hour than, it right. will, than we need to prevent them from leaving. Not what it costs them to live, no, but what what costs them not to leave? Yeah, and I and you know, like with respect to, so I am a capitalist. I have yes. helped found three dozen companies. I was the first investor in Amazon.com. Like I, I believe in markets, but it is it is ridiculous to believe that capitalism, that markets are a good economic system, and also believe that the whole system will come tumbling down if. If companies are required to pay their workers enough to live in dignity and security. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, my message to capitalists is if you can't figure out how to do that, you need to go find another line of work. Right. Become yeah. a ballet dancer. an hour is $31 a year, those yeah. thieves. Everybody. We have this weird mathematical way of thinking it's a zero sum game. If the national minimum wage is seven and a quarter and we raise it to Fifteen dollars an hour, and you pay people double what uh, what they what many people earn. You and I both encounter people in a day who will earn nine dollars an hour or less. They might be casual workers. Somehow, it's a zero sum game. If I've doubled the amount that I pay somebody for uh, for an hour of work, that money has disappeared from the ethers. Not only disappeared from my bottom line, but it's disappeared uh, from the ether. It hasn't disappeared at all. It's a multiple. No. When you give people who earn less money more money. It's actually more effective than giving you or me more money. A human economy 
is not an equilibrium system. Right. It's just not. It's just factually incorrect. And claiming there, it's it's like an ecology. That's what it is. A, a human economy is a is like an ecology. It is a form of an ecology. As so, opposed to like, a natural science or right. or, or a, so, an algorithm. That's right. So claiming that when when wages rise, jobs fall would be like claiming that when plants grow, animals shrink. That's not the way the system works. Right. In right. fact, when plants grow, animals grow. When wages grow, businesses have customers and hire more workers. This is the fundamental law of capitalism. So at the beginning of the coronavirus, and we are now in a moment where it's feeling like the beginning, we're seeing infection rates and death rates at the way they are. There are still people who deliver our food. There are still police. There are still ambulance workers. There are still frontline workers without PPE. And uh, in New York, in the beginning, every night at seven o'clock, we would clap. We would just yeah. open our windows or stand outside and clap for these people. And and I always thought there is some level of realization. You you described it as teamwork, but there is some re level of realization that when it re gets really bad, we can all come together yes. and we can recognize people who are. Uh, faceless and who do their work every day. I keep reminding people, postal workers have been delivering your mail every single day of the coronavirus, touching your stuff that someone else touched and licked. Um, we we have an opportunity because the walls have been come crumbling down. We have an opportunity to do this correctly, to rebuild uh, in a way that that recognizes what people should be paid and recognizes that people should have health care. We're actually kind of doing the opposite at the moment. We have not extended our assistance for for people who are out of work. Maybe that'll change uh, under a new administration. But we're we're not we're not taking this once in a lifetime opportunity to say some of our systems are broken. What an opportunity to change them! Again, it comes down to the meaning system we have embraced as a country. If you believe that people are selfish and that selfishness causes prosperity, then all of this anti-cooperative nonsense makes sense. But here's the thing, Ali, is that we now know with scientific certainty that human beings are intrinsically, evolutionarily cooperative, other regarding, and, and intuitively moral creatures. And what that means is that when you look around at all the prosperity in the world, then you must conclude that, that it was cooperation that was the cause of all that prosperity. That in fact, it, being reciprocal and cooperative is humanity's yep. economic superpower. And, and, and yet we live in a world where lots and lots of people believe that acting like a sociopath is righteous. And right. that is nuts. It's just not true. You and David Rolfe in this uh, great article for Time gave five ideas I think we should steal. Um, idea number four is greed is not good. Being rapacious doesn't make you a capitalist. It makes you a but sociopath. So and yes. I just wish we would learn this everywhere, yeah. that we would teach it to our kids, because we do, through TV and through through our culture, we do develop this idea that it's That's good right. to be greedy and it's good to collect as much as you can for yourself. It's not good, it is so sociopathic. Uh, the other point you made a moment ago, but I wanna, I wanna read it the way you wrote it. Unlike the laws of physics, the laws of economics are a choice. Yes. Neoliberal e economic theory has sold itself to you as unchangeable natural law, when in fact it's social norms and constructed narratives based on pseudoscience. Correct. Correct. And and the really challenging thing is that those norms and constructed narratives are the dominant are the dominant meaning system that our sort of intelligentsia has accepted. Right. The, the problem, Ali, and and the dispiriting thing is that even economists who are theoretically on our side still believe this nonsense, yeah. still literally believe that if you raise wages, it kills jobs. And, and more importantly than, than economists believing it, because we, we, we will air yeah. this a couple of days after we've taped it, so we always have to be careful not to date things, but I have yeah. zero chance that this is gonna date. The United States Senate will not pass a new relief bill because there are senators who have said there's no appetite for the increase in the risk of debt uh, for doing so. Where right. I am actually dealing with people who have an appetite for food that they can't afford, uh, the, the, because they've run out of money. Absolutely. So the hell with the science. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, you know, some some of those votes are just, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, irretrievably awful mean spiritedness. 
some of some of these people legitimately believe this science, nonsense, right? right? Like, uh, again, I mean, uh, you, you may recall that me and my gang, we cooked up this $15 minimum wage. And when I was pitching that even to Democratic United States senators, they thought we had lost our mind. Right. They thought that now when, it's now it's at least a real conversation. That's right. But, but Florida passed it. That's right. Even Democratic senators took Econ 101, right? That told them if you raise wages, it killed jobs. And that and all of these ideas are so deeply embedded in our society that they corrode what is possible to make the society better in 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 really substantial ways. And we have to push past this. And 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 you know, in my opinion, people like AOC break out because they are unburdened, unshackled by this neoliberal nonsense. Yeah, sometimes not having taken the course is actually better. Yeah, they intuitively know it's all not true. The way to make this country stronger is to make American families stronger. The economy is people. Which sounds very conservative. No, the economy is people. When people thrive, the country thrives. The economy will thrive. The civil society will thrive and our political system will thrive. And, and to make sure that people do better means paying them better. Right. And Wait, in our it's, case, it's a lot better. Um, you, you have uh, pointed out point number three of yours is the purpose of the corporation is to improve the welfare of all stakeholders. Small change in wording, but an important one, all stakeholders, customers, workers, community, and shareholders alike. Just a couple of thoughts. Uh, you know, the first thing people, I think, is really important to remember is that this idea that the only purpose of the corporation is to enrich shareholders was not was not um, offered to the world as a normative claim, which is to say, hey, we're rich, screw the poor, we're just going to make all the money. The evil, the, the, the reason that that claim is so uh, corrosive is that, th that these neoliberal econ economists got people to believe that if corporations did nothing but enrich the few, that would be good for everyone. That was the story. And that was a straight up lie. And, and, and the problem we face is that no, you can't restructure a society around the goodwill of a few people at the top. You have to build standards which require people to behave appropriately. Right. So that's why we need a $15 minimum wage at a minimum and a $20 minimum wage imposed on the largest corporations. That's why we have to reestablish the overtime standard to the former high water mark, probably $80,000. That's why we have to impose all these standards to require corporations to pay people enough to live in dignity. And when we do that, um, our capitalist system is going to work a lot better. Our political system is going to work a lot better. And even the rich will be fine. <laughs> you yes, know, like, they'll still be rich. Know, yeah, we'll well, still I'll be end rich. on the same comment, that that the, the benevolence of the wealthy is a good thing. The idea that whether they come to it late or not, um, uh, corporate leaders saying and doing the right things is yes. a good thing, but this is structural change that yes. is required and we've all got to get behind it. Nick, yeah. you have been at it for a long time and I thank you for that and it's great to talk to you again uh, and we are going to, because you've written down all your ideas, we are actually going to steal them all and I think you're quite pleased with that idea. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm very flattered. <laughs> Nick Hanauer, thank you for uh, giving us good ideas we can steal. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Ali. A special thank you to our sponsors.